Today on Engine Power, we're finishing our LS408 built from a catalog. Plus, Mike Downs of Trick Flow Specialties lets us put their Gen X head to the test on the flow bench. And Chris from ARP lends a hand to button it up. Then it's dyno time. Welcome to Engine Power and part two of our LS408 cubic inch power plant. We started this project with a simple plan. Everything was to come from a mail order catalog, even the foundation for the build, a seasoned LQ46 liter iron block. Now we showed you the steps it takes to prep an LS block by performing oiling system upgrades, which extends its longevity, and we even strengthened it with simple techniques you can do in your garage. Now the K1 crankshaft was the last thing to go in, so we'll pick it up from there. If we're lucky, by the end of today, we're going to see how well those 408 cubic inches performs back on the dyno. We're also going to show you what parts it takes to put one together hassle-free. Our LQ4 block only has one bolt hole for the timing chain dampener. Now the one we're using is an LS2 and it requires two bolt holes. So to attach it, TrickFlow offers its adapter bracket that allows the use of this damper on any LS engine. It uses the lower three cam retaining plate bolts for attachment. Now slide the dampener in place, followed by the timing gear. This is to make sure they clear one another. With the damper removed, we can put the bronze bushing in place and install the chain straight up. Now the next thing I want to go over with you is the piston choice for this combo. Now originally the 6 liter came with the full dish piston. That's how they got their 9.5 to 1 compression ratio. Now we want to raise ours up just a little bit to 10.5 to 1. Now what that's going to do is help us make big naturally aspirated power, but still give us a low enough static compression that we can add big boosts later on and stay on pump gas. Now since we know we're going for 1000 horsepower, this is what we came up with. It's a Weisco LS series reverse dome piston with valve reliefs. Now it's made out of a high strength 2618 alloy with strength in mind. And at 466 grams, it's also keeping weight in mind. Now this piston's designed to work with any kind of power adder from nitrous to turbos and will absolutely handle the abuse of high horsepower engines. And we're hanging them on a K1 H beam rod. Now it comes with floating pins and a 2100 journal. And it starts off with a little bit of Royal Purple assembly lube. Now I like to go ahead and have one lock in one side, so that way it slides in. When it gets in position, it stops. Now this is a spiro lock setup, and for any one of you that have used these before, know they can be a pain to go in. The trade-off for that is they won't come out. Now the rings for this piston are pretty trick. The top ring is a 1.2 millimeter stainless steel ring with a gas nitride treatment. Now the second ring is a cast steel with a napier cut and has a phosphate coating on it. Now the third ring is just a standard tension, three millimeter oil setup. But like any engine build, gap is critical. Every file fit set of rings is gonna come with a sheet with several different gap options for several different build options. Now oil scrapers usually don't need to be cut on, even on file fit sets. But this is a good example of why you always check them. There's no gap at all. So we'll cut a little on our Goodson ring filer, and after several attempts, we'll set them at 15 thousandths. And with the spacer ring and oil expander in place, we can install both scrapers. Then our second compression ring, which we set a gap of 26 thousandths, and then the top ring with a gap of 24 thousandths. Now before I put the pistons in, I like to go in and clean the cylinder walls out with some acetone first. Looks pretty clean, right? Now you've seen me use ATF before to get a good ring seat, and it does that by removing any little bit of stone grit left over from the honing process. Don't believe me? Look at this. Now that we've got everything lubed up and ready to install, it's our last chance to go ahead and double check our orientation. Now starting with the rod, we want to make sure that the large chamfer is facing the front on the number one cylinder. And check our valve pockets to make sure they're right, and that dot lines us up to the front. And don't forget to make sure that the large chamfer on the cap is facing the correct way too. These pistons are forged and machined and even the tooling is made here in the United States. And that's how they control the quality of their product. Now on the passenger side, orientation is the same except for the large chamfer on the rods faces towards the back. The piston, however, and the dot still faces to the front. So with a strong block and strong parts, we're off to a good start. Up next, before we install the heads, we're putting them on a flow bench. Can they live up to their claim?
We're back and the short block is done. Now it's time for the cylinder heads. Now we need something that's suitable for that engine in natural aspirated form and when we add the turbo. So we chose these out of the Summit catalog. Trick Flow Specialties Gen X cylinder heads for GM LS engines. In fact, they're here. Now we chose them due to their high flow numbers and their CNC competition porting. Now these things also sport 69cc combustion chambers, two 165 intake valves, and inch 600 exhaust valves. Now here's a quick look at what puts the trick in trick flow. It was founded in 1983 and quickly earned a reputation for its performance big block Ford cylinder heads. Today, trick flow specialties meets a worldwide demand for their premium bolt-on performance parts not just for Fords, but also small and big block Chevys. Manufacturing is in-house, using CNC machines to contour ports to maximize airflow, and machine combustion chambers all the way down to the valve seat area. Their engineers use tools like this Flowbench visualization software to ensure quality control. And then they spend lots of time on the dyno to test power and durability. This is the kind of dedication and talent you've got to have to make products that are worth the money. A product you know will live up to their claims. And all that technology is going to help us achieve our power goal with our Iron Block 408. No one knows them better than Mike Downs, manager of Trick Flow Specialties. Mike, what makes the LS in general so popular nowadays? Well, with the resurgence of the muscle car wars that's really taking place in this country now, we're seeing the engine combinations evolve and, and the factories actually making more power. The LS3 is the latest generation of horsepower from the factory. It's become wildly popular in the aftermarket as well as the uh, LS swap world. We knew that we had a daunting task ahead of us because of the factory head being so good. So the first thing we did is we went to a 12 degree valve angle from the 15 from the factory. Now what that valve angle change means is that from the factory 15 degree, by changing it to the 12 degrees, it actually kicks the bottom of the valve out a little bit away from the piston, giving you more piston to valve clearance. You can run their head no matter whose cam you use with up to 625 thousandths lift and never have to worry about pissing the valve clearance. Well, something that's important to know about that head is we're really looking for clean, non-turbulent air to come out of that. We spent a lot of time tweaking the port, fine changes here and there to get that perfect combination to get the numbers that we're looking for. Mike's not here to just talk the talk. He's here to prove the trick flow promise. And we'll start by showing the factory LS3 head flow numbers on our Superflow flow bench. Got it. And how we're going to do that is by taking a stock LS3 head and flowing it at about five different lift points. Then we're going to take it off, put on that trick flow, and prove why it's the head you need. Now with the checker springs installed, the dial indicator can be positioned on the tip of the valve. This will give us an accurate measurement of the valve's position as we run the flow test. With the gauge set at zero, the valve seated, and with the radius airflow inlet in place, we're ready. Rotating this knob will open the valve to our first test point, which will be at 400 thousandths lift. And that gave us 257 CFM at 500, 296, 600, 303, at 650, 290, and at 700, 293. As good as that factory head is, it does fall off at the high lift numbers where you really want to make some power. And what you'll find is the trick flow head will not do that. All of the dyno testing that we do, we do in a, in a naturally aspirated combination. However, we do design the boosted application into it to accept that. And we're starting again at 400 thousandths. And it gave us 286 CFM. That's 29 CFM better than the factory head. Then at 500 thousandths, 332, a gain of 36. And at 600 thousandths, 359, which is 56 to the better. At 650, 367, that's 77 more CFM. And at 700 thousandths lift, 372 CFM, an astounding 79 CFM gain over stock. So Mike, you're down here in our neck of the woods on our flow bench with a production head. Did you have any reservations about the numbers when we put it on there? Oh, absolutely not. We, we promise to deliver what we say we're going to deliver. And as a result, you'll see we've got 70 CFM over the stock head, and that head never faded over the high lift. Nice. Those airflow numbers are the main reason you would buy a Gen X head to begin with. Now, we get the question a lot. Why not just have your factory head ported? Well, number one, you'll never get the flow numbers out of a factory head that you will the Gen X head. And here's something else. 
When porting a factory head, so much material is removed from the casting that the strength is actually sacrificed. Now this can be a bad recipe when mixed with a boosted application because the added pressure can actually crack it. The trick flow head is a thicker casting to begin with, so it retains all of its strength even after all that serious port work. When we come back, the heads are coming off of the flow bench and going on the engine. Powerful parts won't win races unless you can hold them together. We're back and it's time to dress out our finished short block with more parts from the catalog. Starting with the Melling high volume oil pump we poured it earlier. Securing it to the block are ARP fasteners. The timing cover can go into place now, followed by the balancer. Now it's pressed on and it will center up the timing cover. Our lifters came in a kit that includes the guides and fasteners. The guides keep the lifters in line with the cam's lobes and will also capture the lifter during cam swaps so the head does not have to be removed. Now the Chevy Performance MLS head gasket can go in place, followed by our TrickFlow Gen X 255 cylinder head. There are several different ways to secure the cylinder head to the block, but they aren't all equal. Now they include torque to yield fasteners or the better route, ARP bolts or studs. Now Chris Rashke is here from ARP to help us out with some of his knowledge. But first, we need to understand what torque to yield means. All metals have some elastic properties, which means they can be compressed or more importantly, stretched. When a bolt or stud is stretched, it has a natural tendency to return to its original length. That's why when you torque one down, you're trying to stretch it just enough to add a clamping force that'll keep it in place. This is also known as preload. While stock bolts are fine for stock engines, high performance engines can exceed their limits. And once stretched, they can't be reused. Here's why we have always relied on ARP to hold our projects together. We start out with the finest material. Uh, we heat treat it, we shot peen it, we grind it, and then we roll the threads after heat treat. Uh, the, the, the goal here is to make a fastener that is uh, stronger than the factory fastener, provide additional clamp load, and be reusable. Earlier, we swapped out the factory main bolts on the bottom end for much stronger studs, which is a must for the power we'll make with boost. And we're doing the same thing with the heads. With the head resting on the engine's deck, a stud can be installed finger tight, followed by a washer with lube on the top of it and the stud's threads, the nut can be installed. As the nut is torqued, it provides the clamping force rather than the torque of the fastener itself, avoiding rotational force entirely. Since the stud is torqued from a relaxed state, the pressure from the nut will make it stretch only along the vertical axis without a twisting load. The end result is a more evenly distributed and accurate torque load compared to that of a head bolt. The benefits of having a stud over the bolt is it moves the torsional stress up to the top of the fastener. Uh, on a stud, we have a 7 16 fine thread at the top and an 11 millimeter 2.0 very coarse thread in the bottom. So this is gonna take that stress off of the block and the factory threads. Keep in mind, ARP offers two types of studs, with or without a bottom nose. It's important to know that if you have a stud without a bottom nose, when you install it, you don't want to tighten it up into the block because that'll apply pressure on the run out thread, which will move the stud over to the side. Then when you torque the nut on, it'll move it back over, applying even a greater load onto the stud, which could cause failure. But RLS uses a stud with a bottom nose. And with a little oil applied to the coarse threads, we can drop it in. And you can apply with the bottom nose, you can actually torque the stud up 10, 15 pounds. Uh, holds the stud in place. If you're doing a head swap or a gasket change, the stud doesn't continue to come in and out. And with some ARP Ultra Torque, we'll torque them down. You know, it's important that when you're torquing the head, if something doesn't feel right, you should just stop and take it apart, inspect the faster, uh, inspect everything, make sure everything's still in good shape, uh, and then, and then retorque the fastener. That'll guarantee that you get a good clamp load. Something simple, everybody can do it if they just take their time and use common sense. It's not rocket science. And now you know. We'll be right back. We're back, and we have just enough time to run this LS on the dyno. Now we already installed the factory windage tray and an oil pump pickup. Now it's time to check the clearance between it and the pan. I'll place a small piece of clay on the pickup. Now I can drop the Holly retrofit pan into place. Now it's got an internal baffle, so be careful not to catch the clay on it. We need between a quarter and three eighths of an inch of clearance. If it's too close, flow will be restricted. 
If it's too high, it may not be able to pick up sufficient oil. Our clay measured 237 thousandths of an inch, under a quarter. Add the thickness of the gasket, which is right at 100 thousandths, and we're in our window. With the bottom end done, push rods in place, and new trunnions in our factory rockers, the holly covers can drop on, and we're dyno bound. We built this 408 to handle whatever we throw at it. Now it's all about the foundation, and we have a solid one. For induction, we chose a fast 102 millimeter LSXR composite multi-port intake manifold. It's a great addition for this engine in natural aspirated form and when we add the turbo. It accepts your stock or a 102 millimeter big mouth throttle body like this. 39 pound an hour injectors are supplied fuel via a set of fast billet fuel rails. Now it's time for the fast electronics. Now the new XFI 2.0 is loaded with new features, like a self-tuning option. Now this version here actually has an internal data logger, five bar map sensing, and controls for your power adder or torque converter. Now the cool thing about this is there's several different versions to control everything from daily drivers to pro mods. It begins with the harnesses. The first one is for the injectors. Now it's foolproof since each connection is numbered. The main harness houses several connectors and bare wires that need to be hooked up. Now we'll start with making the connections to the bulk injector connector. Then pay attention to the labels and make the rest of your connections. For Spark, 8 MSD coil packs. We needed a header that will let those big heads breathe. JBA ceramic coated long tubes will do the job. On this setup, we won't be able to show you all the things these ECUs can do. We just don't have the time. Now we'll get in depth when we put the turbo on down the road. For now, let's see what this 408 will do, natural aspirated. After the break-in and up to temp, we'll take it to 6,000 RPM. It's running smooth, sounds awesome. And best of all, no leaks. 562 horsepower, 538 pound-feet of torque. That's a great start. Let's see what 6,500 RPM will do. 563 horsepower, 541 pound-feet of torque. Still solid. Let's add one degree of timing, see where it goes. When we run an engine on a dyno, there's a lot of numbers moving around on this screen. Now we're only looking at two, which are the most important vitals, oil pressure and air fuel ratio. Now the big thing is we wanna see 10 pounds of oil pressure per every thousand RPM. So at about 65 to 6,800 RPM where we're running this engine, we want between 65 and 70 PSI of oil pressure. Now on the air fuel ratio, if we see that going lean during a run, we stop and add fuel. If you don't take care of that, you're going to kill an engine. Now speaking of 6800, let's make a pull. Five hundred and seventy-three horsepower with five hundred and fifty pound-feet of torque. Remember, we built this entire engine out of a catalog, and Summit Racing will have a list available if you plan on building a pretty stout LQ4. Now, the next time you see this thing, we're adding boost and going for over a thousand horsepower to get it ready for one of you. That's right, because we're giving this thing away. 